Welcome, welcome everyone. Good morning, good evening, good night. As you all know, chime in on the chat. Where are you from? Today is an amazing day, amazing way to start this new webinar series about cultivating life in soils. I have the honor to be the host today for this incredible discussion between Dr. Vandana Shiva and Dr. Elaine Ingham on the future of farming. So uh, without further ado, we have a quick uh, uh, introduction and we're gonna jump in on the discussion for the future of farming and then get to our Q&A sessions. Uh, as you know, uh, you will be muted for the duration of the webinar to ensure good audio quality for all attendees. Make sure to put your questions on the Zoom Q&A session. And if you need support, talk with our amazing staff in the chat and with our other attendees. Have fun and enjoy this incredible moment. These two amazing women don't need introduction and we can uh, savor every single second with the two of them. So I'm gonna skip the presentation for today. I have the honor to be the host and I'm Carla Portugal here with you guys today. So jumping to the first question. Uh, first, thank you for this opportunity, incredible opportunity to be with the two women that inspire so many of us, including myself. So if I get emotional, bear with me, <laughs> we're gonna get there. So I wanna open with why is it important to ed educate the public and not just farmers about soil health. Who are we, how are you to decide to, who's gonna go first? Vand and I, I'm gonna turn yeah. it to you so I can respond to your response when you hand it over to me. <laughs> sure. Hello, Elaine, big hug to you. Yes, uh, indeed. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I think there are many reasons why every human being should be deeply conscious about how important living soils and healthy soils are. First, because we are the soil, you know, humus is the root for human. We come from the soil and we go back to the soil. And in between, the, the, our life should be li lived in partnership with the soil and care for the soil. The second is, we know now, through the work of people like you, Elin, that industrial farming began on the wrong premise. When I did the book on the Green Revolution to understand what happened to Punjab and why people were being killed, uh, I read every textbook before writing my book on the violence of the Green Revolution. And I realized the soil chapter said the soil is an empty container for pouring nitrogen and for phosphorus and potassium fertilizers into. That's all it was, an empty container. And But they did empty the life of the soil out. Um, the second reason, the, the third reason why we have to understand how valuable living soil is, because now even doctors, you know, those of us who started to work on ecological farming and we realized how important soil is and the health of the soil and our health is one, now doctors are finding out that this explosion of epidemics of chronic diseases, which actually are not separate diseases, they are different symptoms of metabolic disorders that all come from the sickness of the soil. And the top cancer specialists, the top heart specialists are moving into becoming ecological organic farmers as healers. Uh, the data is so clear that when the soil is enriched and it's healthy, not only does, do, does it give us good healthy food, more importantly, it actually gives us real food, food that has all the micronutrients and trace elements and phytochemicals that make for the health of this very complex body. So if you care for the earth, you care for your, your uh, being of the earth, you care for your health, even if you're not a farmer, taking care of the soil and being aware of how important the soil is, is vital, particularly in our time. 
where the soil is being appropriated, just like it was during colonialism. Yeah, and uh, it was turned into being a place for rent collection rather than giving life. So, yeah, couldn't agree more. It's vital. Yeah, we have to understand um, how how to interact the public with the farmers. It's it's the market that uh, farmers are really um, looking at. Uh, what do the human beings need from the food that they're eating, and that um, those nutrients come from the biology in the soil. So it's. Uh, you know, when you ask questions like, why is educating the public and not just farmers uh, about soil health uh, important? Why is that? Because um, the farmers are going to grow the plant material in the and have the healthiest possible situation where you're getting the nutrients, where you're getting um, all the, the benefits um, from, you know, the plant material that has all of the gut microflora on and in it so that when you consume that, your digestive system becomes the um, mechanism where all of these positive things in your food get translated into you. Um, so we have to have both things. We've got to make the general public understand that that's the relationship that's going on. And if the first thing you do is run out and put on toxic chemicals, you're going to kill everything that determines that transfer of the nutrients from the plants into the human being through the gut microbiomes. So uh, just like we have micro, we have biomes in the um and at eye level for human beings, we've got biomes for microorganisms in your digestive system. So we've got to put the information out that to really understand your own health, you've got to understand what's going on with the biology in your soil. It is often, you know, amazed me that we didn't notice, uh, human beings didn't notice the transfer to giant chemical companies that want to make certain that they've got a never ending um, a never ending set of conditions that means the chemical companies are going to be basically ruling everything. I think uh, the current political situation in the United States is just a, a, an unbelievable um, situation you know, where the big chemical companies um, own everything, basically. Now, how do we get them back? How do we repeat what um, the people in India did back in, what was it, uh, Vandana, that you were talking about, um, 1887 or something like that? Um, 1857. 57, where you managed to escape that control, um, that money grubbing uh interaction uh and and you got away from it in india we've got to go through that situation in the united states where we exit the large chemical companies from controlling every decision that's being made so lot lots of work to do and we've got to make clear um those steps uh we've got to show the data and uh, that's exactly what we're trying to do at Soil Food Web um, mm -hmm. around the world. And so, yes, Vandana, I want to come in September. And please, please, we'll really do a celebration together of the seed and the soil. Yep. So uh, yeah. we'll, we'll get our um, people that um, do our itineraries and make sure that I can get there and then you've got to come back and work at the farm that we're um, developing in um, sure. in in Oregon so that it's the same sort of situation show people how to do all of this work and it, you realize very rapidly that the workload gets to be less and less and less yes. as soon as you turn over all of that business to the microorganisms and the plants in exactly. that soil. 
They yeah. don't need our help in taking up nutrients. We've just got to stop destroying the microorganisms that are central for these interactions. Absolutely. It's not like it's not like the microbes are the most important part of this. Now that you know, that's a silly trick when somebody tries to this is the you know first and foremost thing. It all has to work together. You can't succeed without any part. So yeah. put you know, different uh, characters. The cast is going to be slightly different when we go to different parts of climate, when we're uh, on the seashore or we're inland, when we're dealing with uh, freezing cold in the winter time, with uh, uh, compared to the tropics where it never gets even close to being that cold. So lots of work to do and uh, hopefully people understand it's our health the health of the planet it's all interconnected and we can't not work on it amazing <laughs> what i start you the two of you are kind of i have to hold myself to not start crying for joy here because it's like again thank you so much so for our next question what message do you have for groups strengthening and even opening the Regen Ag Path for women and minority movements or groups everywhere? Who wants to start? Yeah, I I'll start. Yeah. Okay, go for it. <laughs> um. <laughs> Are you ready? If you're ready, Elin, you go first. Um, okay, we can switch back and forth that way. Um, as long as we know that, you know, whoever spoke last gets to sp speak first. Um, and I'm assuming you can cut this out of the video. Uh, but um, I have to be able to see the question. Where did the question go? Um, can you I will share again, Elaine. Yes, just a yeah. second. Sorry. If you could leave that up uh, at all, is that possible? Mm -hmm. uh, what message do you have for groups strengthening and even opening the regenerative ag path for women and minority movements uh, and groups everywhere? Um, that's a really loaded question. Um, to, to strengthen and open the regenerative agriculture path or, um, you know, what not what um, Vandana is doing it um, in India, what we're doing uh, around the world, um, trying to get people to understand that they have to understand um, what's going on in the plant, in the soil. How do you maintain that um, healthiness? Um, we've got to give those, uh, have markets where the women or the minority groups can sell products to. How do you make sure that they're, um, what, what they're growing, um, what is in their soil is going to promote the health of the people they sell their products to? Um, how do we ma make certain that the full set of nutrients in the proper forms are being produced and you know for women and minority movements i you know you you've got to have um protection to those uh, for those people to make certain that they they can carry out production um without being uh, bothered uh, without being threatened by huge companies coming in and wanting to buy all the land i think vandana you said that um, it, the first thing that happened when uh, the um, you know, the British came to India was to make sure they got rid of the commons. They bought up all of that property as if that was something that you could pay the government in India to um, take those common um, fr co the commons away from people using it to grow good food. So we've got to reverse those processes. They're a little more complex when we're dealing with chemical companies. Industrial agriculture has to be done away with, basically. 
Over to you, Vandana. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Elaine. Um, and, you know, given uh, for, for four decades, I have been working to create an agriculture system that works for the earth, works for those who grow the food, and works for the people who eat the food. And increasingly, you know, um, I, my focus it has shifted to women for the simple reason, you know, they are not the marginals. They're the ones who know. Because even in, in industrialized societies, at the end of the day, if you really look at the hours spent in getting the food, processing the food, definitely in the southern countries, all that work is done by women. I wrote a book for the United Na uh, for the FAO. Most farmers are women. Yeah, and uh, and today when we are trying to find the path of regeneration, who are your teachers? First, nature, nature in all her plurality, nature, you know, biodiversity in the soil and soil food web, the biodiversity of seeds and plants. But it's women, and it's indigenous cultures. Now, who are why are they marginal today? Because they were pushed off the land. You know, everyone who's called a minority today, you know, used to have a relationship with the land. They were dispossessed, put in reserves, you know, put in enclosures. And, uh, but they still have that knowledge. And they still have the deep urge of belonging to the earth. So I would say to strengthen women and minority groups, we need to put them at the center of the transformation. We need to put the soil and the earth at the center of the transformation. We have to make them the teachers and guides to the future. And as Elin said, all the exploitation, you know, first exploit them by displacing them. And then you exploit them by turning them into slaves in an industrial system. And then because you've turned them into slaves into an industrial system, you pretend that bringing drones to spray pesticides is a liberation of the farm workers. But that's the argument being used. And the interesting thing is, of course, is who's pushing farming without farmers? Who's pushing total neglect of soil? One of the richest men in the world, who's become the biggest farmland owner in America through shadow companies. So you can't really track that he, yeah. Now, will he farm? He'll never farm. Will he regenerate the soil? He'll never regenerate the soil. Will he talk to a woman? Or will he talk to an indigenous person? See, I'm just beginning, will you teach me? No. He'll try and get rid of the farmers. That's his agenda, farming without farmers, food without farms. So when Elaine talks about how important food is to health, and we know processed food, ultra-processed food, is already responsible for 75% of the chronic disease in the world today. There's so much literature in it. To turn it into ultra, ultra, ultra-processed food, lab food, which will need more feedstock, it will emit more greenhouse gases. And to say you're offering a climate solution through fake food, yeah? Fake food and farming without farmers. I think we all need to become people who care for the soil. And then we need to turn to those who have continued to remember that soil is living. And together we celebrate this regeneration. Yes. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't have words to express. I'm just absorbing everything here and try to cope myself. The two of you are incredible. So uh, I want to explore a bit more uh, all the amazing stories the two of you encountered in your life and uh, working with your students and many actions that you took during this beautiful path. Which is one of your favorite stories that you can share with us that give you hope for the world when talking about regen agriculture? Vandana, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh so, you know, of course, my food and agriculture journey, four decades, uh, began facing tragedies, facing deaths, you know, and saying, why? Why are so many people dying and being killed? Where is the violence from? Uh, but over the years, you know, uh, 
saving seeds, working with ecological farming, creating local markets, you know, putting farmers and eaters closer together and bringing biodiversity back in the food system. Uh, I'll share just two stories. One, that when we started to save seeds, we didn't ask ourselves that, oh, we said this kind of seed. We said nature protected all seeds. Our ancestors gave diversity. Let's save everything we find. And among the seeds we saved that farmers had evolved and nature had given are salt tolerant and flood tolerant seeds that have helped us face climate disasters. Of course, I call them the bio pirates. They when they steal these seeds, they then tinker it a little, do a little gentry, and say, oh, we invented this trait. No, they haven't. They've just stolen the traits. But that power of biodiversity and the depth and width of the knowledge that the seed holds and people hold, that's one. But the second is, during COVID and the lockdown, it ended up being about two years of not functioning normally. Because I work with women, they create seed banks, they grow gardens of hope, they do organic farming. During the lockdown, their gardens and seed banks supported their entire community. Because people depended on the non-renewable corporate seed, couldn't buy it or couldn't afford it. And more importantly, those who were growing food for the global supply chains, the trucks weren't coming. There was no market, it's all collapsed. And the local economies with the soil having its fertility, the seeds being living, and communities being alive as communities really saw the difference. And the biggest leap took place in the area, which has become a disaster zone because of Bt cotton, one of the GMO cotton. You know, in the first generation, there were only two, the herbicide resistant and the Bt toxin. And the Bt cotton led to massive suicides. We lost 400,000 farmers to suicide, and 85% of these are in the cotton area, which had become a monopoly for Monsanto with the Bt cotton. And when I saw these suicides, I started to, uh, you know, we, we looked for old cotton seeds, we multiplied it, we did that. I just had my colleagues telling me this many farmers have saved seed and about how we distribute it, how we give it to the hand spin, hand, hand waving Kadi ashrams, and, um, and how we multiply the seed and distribute it. And I am confident that we're going to see the end of Monsanto's BT cotton in this area where we work, central India. But more importantly, we are seeing the regeneration of the fact that cotton never grew as a monoculture. People are growing food crops again. People are creating local processing. Women ask me, please bring us a mill so we can grow linseed again and process because linseed is the most popular oil in that area. And now they're running the economy. People come from 300 miles away to buy this pure oil because oil has become a scarcity with palm oil and GMO soya. So, you know, the monopolies, the poison, the monocultures can all be broken. Yeah? By, by just turning to the richness of life in nature, in the seed and the soil. And as I, Elaine said, it does all the work. All you have to do is stop the harm. Yeah? And then miracles happen. And it's just amazing to me that we've lost that knowledge um, that because some large um, set of people can come, <clears throat> can arrive and take away all of the common land so that those, uh, you know, the people who are small scale and would usually work within a village or within a town. Um, their commerce was completely cut off because the land that they needed was uh, being taken over by large monetary concerns. Um, I just, that amazes me that that happens. Um, I also like the, you know, that you're pointing out that it's diversity that's really important. Um, a lot of times when we're in kind of conflict with that is where uh, the the attitude that you've got to identify everything down to 
uh, a genetic level. You can't use these microorganisms unless you've got the, all of the genetic footprint present. And, and I'm always saying, no, we don't have to go there because that's just too expensive. You can't be measuring the DNA of all of the microorganisms in a natural diversity situation. How many bacteria, uh, different species of bacteria are present in that healthy soil? And there are some people that are suggesting that it's well into the thousands of different um, uh, species of microorganisms, and you've got to identify all of those species before you can use this material. Somehow human beings have, and plants have managed to survive for how long on this planet? Life on this planet has been around for 4.5 billion years, and uh, we got along just fine without understanding, taking things, everything down to those um, little tiny compartments. Instead, what we want to do with that uh, diversity is to make certain that we have the, the broadest diversity of these organisms possible. And we want to use the conditions of the environments that will select for the growth of the beneficial organisms for your plants and not get stuck on a very expensive um, identification of each and every uh, species present. We want to make certain that we've got the right conditions and we can go forth and make certain that the um, microorganisms in the soil will be providing, excuse me, will be providing um, the ability to prevent diseases and pests from attacking the root system or from attacking the above ground part of the plant. We have to cover the surfaces of the plant uh, above and below ground. So the, uh, you know, the leaves when they first start coming out from the seed from below ground, covered with really beneficial organisms that they're getting from the soil. You don't have to do any work to do that. As opposed to you've got to go out and sample immense amounts of the soil in order to understand where, uh, you know, how many species of bacteria or fungi or protozoa or nematodes or microarthropods, earthworms, all of those things are there for a reason. They have jobs. They do those jobs. You as the farmer, the way you pay them for what they do is to provide plants that you're putting into the soil and you're letting them grow, you're allowing those microorganisms to use the surfaces, both above and below ground, to protect them from diseases and pests and problem organisms. So we're working on trying to understand all of those interactions, but a lot of it is just take a step back and Use your nose to determine whether it's the beneficial organisms or the not so beneficial organisms. You can use a simple microscope to identify whether you're dealing with disease causing organisms or more ben more likely to be beneficial. So we're working out that um, structure that works in the adaptation to each and every ecosystem, um, each and every, uh, uh, where we've got all of the plants and or organisms and the human beings and their animals working together to improve the diversity, to improve the ability to grow plants that are protective for the human beings who consume the, the um the seeds, the consume the plant parts. So it's not expensive. And I always have to laugh at a uh, chemical company guys who I was once want to say, it's so expensive to go back to where we started with agriculture. What they've tried to make people believe is you have the cheapest way to grow plants is to use their chemical approach where you're having to buy 
inorganic fertilizers and pesticides and nematicides and all of these different things that kill. Nope, that's the wrong paradigm. We've got to shift away from that and we've got to realize that it's diversity as maximize as much as possible using key conditions within your soils, within your composts, within uh, conversion of waste into good fertilizer. And you can do it yourself without a great big chemical company to do it for you. Brilliant. Now I'm going to share uh, the two of you with the, the, our amazing attendees and start the Q&A. So the first question is from Bob. Thank you, Bob. How best can we challenge governments to make agroecology and soil health the priority in order to resolve the climate and related health crisis? Who wants to start? I think it's my turn to start. <laughs> <laughs> Back and forth, uh, you know. So I think we can, the way we challenge governments um, to make agroecology, soil health a priority is to get out there and start um, having, like the Navdanyan needs to be replicated every place on the planet. We've got to promote those people, those um, folks who are, who are taking classes from me and we're showing them how you get the least expensive um, agricultural system is the one that is of most benefit to human beings, to their animals, to the, the, the um, soil. Uh, all of it is, we, you know, switch back to what, what humanity was doing 200 years ago um, and get away from reliance on big, um, big farm um, uh, situations where they're convincing you that it is extremely expensive. It's going to be a lot of hard work. Um, you've got to have legions of, uh, hmm, can I call them slaves? Because that's really what they're made into by uh, these interactions with uh, large chem large companies that control so much because they've got to make a lot of money. We've got to yank that rug out from underneath them. So how do we do that? Over to you, Vandana. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we're living through a period which actually began with globalization and corporate rules written by the corporations that control the fertilizers and chemicals, who now control also the seed, corporations like Cargill, which control the trade, corporations that process food into junk, the Pepsis and the Cokes and the Nestle's. And these are the people who wrote the WTO rules and the treaties, the trade related intellectual property rights, the agriculture agreement and the sanitary and phytosanitary agreement sounds so good, but it's basically force junk food on people and force sickness on the world. Uh, and we have seen how they literally by writing the rules change government policies and government regulations. Right now, while we are talking, in Europe, I think today, they were going to have a vote on deregulation of GMOs. Now with this new uh, clothing of the new gene technologies, the CRISPR-Cas9, it has about 20 different names in different places. In one place, I think in, in Italy, it's even called assisted evolution. Nature doesn't know how to work. So they're assisting the evolution by doing genetic engineering, using all techniques. You know, they still have to use the vectors. They still have to use. That's why those two, those animals which are going to be hornless ended up being loaded with bacteria because the, the myth is it's all cut and paste. Nothing can come from outside, no foreign genes. No, but you still have to introduce foreign genes to introduce this CRISPR cassette. So there is this desperate attempt to deregulate everywhere. And in these kind of times, 
I think there are three things we need to do to reclaim the governments as accountable to the people, as representative of the people, not the representative of corporations. First is spread the practices that show the other way and with it, change the narrative. Well, at the end of the day, it's about narrative. You know, the industrial agriculture narrative is soil is empty, seed is empty, everything we do, and therefore we must have intellectual property. Uh, we have to show the narrative, both in terms, change the narrative to living systems, and then show that what the corporations claim to be Im improvement is actually causing harm to all the living processes. That Elin works with soil, we work with in biodiversity and seed. The second thing we have to do, and this is what we did on the GMO question, we said the centralized authorities are captured, but the local is still responsible to the people. So begin with local councils, begin with towns, begin with regions, and start shifting to policies. It could be GMO-free policies. It could be get the glyphosate, even while they've endorsed glyphosate again, but local councils are not giving in. And they're still saying we will be glyphosate free. Uh, so begin from the base. First is begin with the practice and be the examples. Second, begin from the local upwards. And the third is just continue to spread our stories and make that the, you know, I, I, you know as a physicist, I know the basic you know, reality is not solid stuff, you know, unlike the Cartesian thinking and the Baconian thinking. Life is a flow, and life is a flow of energy, and life is a flow of vibration. And when things connect, they explode in resonance. You know, my work on non-locality taught me this, that, you know, how do plants control them? The, the, how do the soil organisms work? They have intelligence, and they have non-locality, they are getting signals from far away. And it's, it's all working in a deep, deep resonance. And when people feel extremely despondent because things are really being pushed in the wrong direction, I think we need to turn to nature. We need to turn to the soil microbe. We need to turn to the gut microbe. I say, if all of these millions, billions of organisms can work in concert and harmony, we, at the level of our thinking, our paradigm, and our practice, on the basic thing of food we must all eat, you know, we can create a resonance if we are all aligned in the way we think and the way we do things. Just beautiful. It's uh, like we need to go back to understand the fact that we are part of nature, not independent species that yeah. just rely on them back and forth. So uh, we, we have to be like the police people or the police organisms that, um, you know, how, and how do you put together that, um, that structure mm -hmm. that has the authority to go out and um, declare that this area of um, agriculture is doing it is, harming things more than they're benefiting so that that can get converted over to something that is completely positive mm -hmm. uh, that's yeah um yeah. producing the, that worldwide wide system um we got got a lot of work to go but at least mm -hmm. we're starting at least we're beginning yep so the next question is from Barry. Thank you, Barry. Uh, Dr. Vandana and Dr. Elaine, you spoke briefly about the fact that we need to exit the large chemical companies to move fo forward with this. How would you suggest changing the paradigm for conventional ag to switch large farmers, be that, or, that can be either dairy, hog, chickens, etc., to farming in a holistic, regenerative approach? Because small hobby farms cannot be the example. They need to see large scale farms make the shift for them to be interested. I have nothing against hob farms. Hobby <laughs> farms. <laughs> yeah. The I think we should not see 
large farms, first of all, we shouldn't define them as conventional. This is hugely unconventional agriculture pushed on them. You know, it, it, in our country, we still don't have factory farms. In the US, you do. But just look at how long, how old these factory farms are, not even two decades old. And when you think that this farmer made it independent decisions, just look at three things. Look at the fact that every chicken in a chicken farm, uh, a factory farm is owned by Cargill. The, the so-called farmer is merely a, a watchman, you know, just looking. But, the you know, whether it's the, the animals, the seeds, everything is owned by the corporation. So don't see these farms as functioning independently. They are slave extensions of the dominant paradigm of corporate farming. And, and small farms are not hobby farms. Most of the farms of the world are small. And my research has shown small farms produce more. And FAO has shown that 80% of the food we eat today, the food we eat, not the commodities we trade, two different things. The food we eat today comes from small farms. But it's not in the trade calculus. All that's counted is what moves uh, you know, in container ships and then turns into 90% today of the grain that's grown, the corn and soya, all GMO, is going for biofuel and animal feed. It's very intensive. So the feed industry is driving. In my reading, factory farms grew when the, the big grain industry realized we could collect lots and lots of subsidies for animal feed for factory farms. So they forced the farmers into the factory system. Uh, so what I would say basically is begin not where corporations have enslaved the farmer. Begin with where farmers who survive are still there and are resisting. Look at the reports on the protests in Europe right now. In America, it's all so fragmented that you can't see the kind of protests that are out in Germany, in Poland, in France, turn anywhere, England. Today I got a message from, from Scotland. They're out on the streets. Begin with the best practices that Elaine teaches, that Navdanya teaches. Move from them to those who are resisting being made to disappear because the farmers are fighting for their survival. Then move to the bigger farms that have been kept, including look at the way billionaires and corporations are becoming the biggest farmland owners. So don't see the situation in a static condition. I mentioned 90% people used to be farmers in America, now they're 2%. Europe has lost 30 million, 30 million family farms. So we have to, like I said, reclaim the land. And these are not hobby farms, they are the main backbone of the food system. And I know many large landholders who are ecologically conscious. They know that beyond the scale, care is not a possibility. So what they are doing is dividing their large holdings among many, many small farms. And there are hundreds of ways you can develop, develop partnerships. That at the end of it, is the small farm is the unit. It can be aggregated into 100 small farms in one place, so 20 small farms in another place. But I think this large and small issue and the fact that there's a conventional, no, start seeing industrial agriculture as an aberration created by the poison cartel. Start seeing real farming as regenerating the life of the soil and our biodiversity. And we have to turn farming not into a vocation that must go extinct, but the vocation of everyone for the future, not just on farms, but in your gardens, in your balconies. And I have watched in Greece as it collapsed in 2008. And I would go and say, you know, you can grow your food, save your seeds. And they created self-sufficiency. Yeah, it, The earth is generous, the seed is generous, the soil is generous. We just need to realize that they have the potential and we need to stop the blindness that we put in our head.
that we are empty heads, the soil is empty, seed is empty, and we have to constantly buy everything, now big data, which has been mined from us. One more layer of slavery. And this is where all the subsidies are going. If you look in every country, where are the subsidies going? Drones, vertical farms, yeah? Everything we don't need. So I, I think sh shedding the false narrative and with sincerity and honesty, seeing how the earth works, seeing how good farming works and aspiring towards ensuring that every species, every person gets access to good food. Because, you know, the bees are dying because they're being poisoned. The soil organisms are disappearing because they are being, you know, the, the urea. We've got so much data. Amazing. I'll just give you two figures. So the nitrogen went down in the chemically farmed uh, farms in our valley, but it's increased 100% without applying synthetic fertilizer. And zinc, which is becoming a key element, it's declined by 37% in the chemical farms in 20 years. And on our farms, organic, 14%. So, I, you know, this whole issue, I, I think you should do a cartoon book on the myths of industrial agriculture and the reality of working with the earth and the soil and the seed and regenerating farms. I'd love to do that. Let's get going well, let's on this together, project. Ali. Yeah. yeah. Eileen, let's do it together. I think it'll be very good. A, a video and a little cartoon book. Yep. That that would be great, and it would be very eye opening to people. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's may you know, get get like the folks and kiss the ground or kiss the earth because they've made those videos, um, to, and they do quite a good job. So, yeah, let's um, let's sit down and think this one through after we're finished with this. Uh, with with what we're putting on here uh, with uh, Soil Food Web. We only have so many people to do so many jobs. So <laughs> but let's get going on this. This should be good. Thank you. Vandana, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, just one more, yeah. Okay. So I will jump ahead and I know I have a feeling that you're going to like this one. It's from Corinne. Thank you, Corinne. Our aim is to become independent of the corporate seeds, but most local sources of our loan seeds in the country are giving much lower productivity and resistance to pests than hybrid ones. What do you recommend we do? How can this problem be mitigated? You've got to get the microorganisms back into the soil because the problem here is not that the, the seeds are deficient is that uh, the diversity of microorganisms in the soil are deficient. Um, it's that step that's been totally wiped out. And if the heirloom seeds are producing um, exudates that are meant to wake up the, all of these microorganisms in the soil to do the job of protecting the plant, but we've gone through and we've killed all of those microorganisms or 95% of them are gone. Uh, they're not there anymore. Um, we've got to get them back. Well, where do you go to look for that diversity? Those few spots that are still left where we can go and take a very small amount. We need only a gram, say, of, of soil from any particular spot bring that back and inoculate your soil, inoculate your compost, um, you know, where you're taking your wastes and you're converting that into really good plant material, um, you know, to put in the nutrients and the organisms back into the system that we need to have. And that's the main step we have to go forward. We've got to get the biology back in the soil. And so we've got to get those, um, you know, national parks, um, parks within your town, within your city, within your village, where disturbance hasn't been allowed to occur. 
well, and think of most people's backyards. We don't really disturb them much. So we're improving diversity within our backyards and our gardens. And so maintain the um, microorganisms that you might need in all kinds of different conditions in your own garden. Uh, you know, the, the this is what I've been doing all these years, saving seeds. We, I think our different community seed banks have about 4,000 varieties of rice. On our farm, we have 750 because each climate has a, different varieties. Uh, our one with the Bay of Bengal that gets hit by cyclones is more than a thousand. That can, you know, now that we multiply it, we can distribute it uh, after the tsunami, after the super cyclone. Now, when I did the book on the Green Revolution, I realized that one of the things that creates a very distorted perception is the idea of yield. You know, they talk yield per acre. Why is this idea of yield not good enough for good farming? First, it doesn't tell you what's the state of the soil. What state did you leave it in? Because if you take all the work that Elaine does, it's actually not increased yield because it's destroyed the soil organisms. It's a decline the overall yield potential of an ecosystem. Second, it doesn't tell you about the state of the farmer. It doesn't tell you about the quality of the food. Yeah. So when you talk productivity, you're meaning the weight and mass of nutritionally empty toxic commodities. That's what you're talking about. And that's no relevance because you don't want the toxics and you don't want nutritionally empty food. And this idea that it's not productive comes from weight. It doesn't come from measuring nutrition. So I've substituted yield per acre with nutrition and health per acre, which is, of course, connected to how, how you treat the soil. And we did a whole study from different ecosystems, and we can sh we've shown that indigenous seed and ecological farming can feed two times a year's population with good nutrition. But we've just finished a study on some of our native meats, which are called primitive and low yielding. And just look at the difference. So the native weeds, which are called low yielding, have a 146% more calcium than the crops you think are more productive. So eating, you think it's productive because of weight, but it is 146% less calcium. For your health, it's not productive. Iron, 135% less. Manganese, 169% less. And zinc, 80% less. So we have to start looking at the health and nutrition of the soil, the health and nutrition in the seed, and the interaction of the soil and the seed that increases it even more. And then the processing, because some processing destroys the nutrition and health of the soil, and some processing enhances it when you do it right. So we are at a very exciting moment because all this amazing knowledge that's in the seed and in the soil and all of the indigenous knowledge systems held by women, held by indigenous cultures, that was submerged and buried. It is now growing again. And we need to, you know, I think four things we need to stop doing is calling indigenous seeds unproductive, those heirloom seeds. You might need to eat one-tenth of the amount. The soil is empty now. The soil is full of life and is the basis of life. That chasing cash crop for the global commodity market is the way for farmers to grow. It's the way that for farmers to first get enslaved and then be thrown out. And finally, that food is a commodity you buy and sell. Now we need to realize that Food is the currency that links healthy soil to healthy plants and our health. And this, this moment is an amazing moment, as Elian said, that actually this wider awareness increases our ability to see how by doing less, we can grow more. Because all other beings are partnering with us. <laughs> And here I thought I would be able to retire. <laughs> no, you can't. Not yet. Yep. Never will. I just, I can't stay, <laughs> you know, uh, boredom is, is the worst thing that um, occurs. So 
will never happen. So we've got to get together and start working on how are we going to present this. And then once we present it to farmers and, and people is uh, how do we maintain mon monitor the success going on. Yeah. And may I now take a leave? I've just had a call. My family's been delaying its dinner. It's 8.30 p.m. for me. And another big hug, Elaine. And I hope to see you in September, early October, whenever it's, we'll work out on the itinerary. Yep. Wonderful. Absolutely. And Great. together, you know, the little seed and those microbes in the soil are going to topple the industrial farming paradigm and the corporate monopolies. Yay. That's the way. Thank you so Bye. much, Vandana. Thank you, Vandana. Talk to you soon. Guys, can you hear me? I have the impression that my microphone's not working. Can you hear me, Elaine? I can hear you. Okay. Awesome. So my gosh, what a webinar. I kind of trying to keep up myself here with this much level of information. I have to say, uh, unfortunately, we could not go through all of the questions. Thank you, everyone, for these amazing questions. Was I was having a hard time here to, and all our backs, uh, our staffers are having a hard time to put all the questions together. So this is what we love. Thank you so much. Oops, you faded out, Carla. Carla, can't hear you. Oh gosh, just now I can. Okay. I think you yeah, have to my be microphone cool. is fading. Let me yeah. change here. Can you hear me? You're a little Justin, quiet. Justin, can you hear me? I think you have to move closer to your um Yeah, I think that yeah, you're okay. You're okay there. I think it's just uh, your microphone's not picking up from very far away. Nope, not, it's not working at all. Can you hear me? Yep, testing, now, testing. now I can okay. hear, yep. Okay. And this is because we tested the sound system yesterday. So thank you everyone for your patience. <laughs> so uh, now it's time to talk a little bit about the webinar and uh, one of the reasons we are here today. So we are launching a new program and called Level Up Your Soil Package. With this new package, you're gonna have full access to the Soil Food Lab Foundation courses where you have many hours with Dr. Elaine to learn about the basics of what we need to understand to have a health software web where we go. The price of the package is $2,000.50 and you will get access to the brand new soil food web where we're gonna have a sneak peek with our amazing cohort of mentors expanding a bit more of what everything Elaine taught us so far. Then you also have access to the Soil Sponge Workshop with Didi Perhouse, which is a live interactive course. And this is exclusive early bird coupon. So if you have any questions, if you need any support, please contact our staff via into at soilfoodweb.com or post your quest questions here in the chat and we have them to help you. Do not forget that this early bird offer ends on February 28th of this year, midnight at Pacific time zone. So if you have questions, please chime in. Do not hesitate to contact us. So, oh, okay. Uh, we have two offers here. One is the Level Up Your Soil Package, which I already explained to you. And another offer is just to get the Soil Food Web Essentials, which is a transformative program on living soil. You have four, more than five hours of self-paced online lectures, and they are presented by Dr. Elaine and our dynamic uh, soil experts team and also is an early bird coupon, 
which is $199. So again, if you have questions, chime in in the chat and our staff will happily help you. Okay, now we're gonna uh, watch a quick video, have fun and get back to you soon. Oh gosh. Bear with me here. My mouse is, okay, here we go. Welcome to the Soil Food Web School, where our mission is to empower individuals and organizations worldwide to rejuvenate the health of their soils. Whether you're a farmer, a dedicated grower, or someone who cares about soil regeneration, we are here to provide you with the essential tools and inspiration. Our goal is to support you in regenerating soils within your farms, gardens, communities, and ecosystems. Join us on this journey as we equip you to elevate your ability to take practical action, no matter where you are on the planet. As we head into 2024, we continue to expand our course offerings and create opportunities for our learning community to support resilient ecosystems. Right now, we are proud to introduce the Soil Food Web Essentials course taught by a diverse group of Soil Food Web School educators and from now until February 29th, this new course is bundled with our flagship foundation courses taught by Dr. Elaine Ingham and the Soil Sponge Regeneration Workshop with Dee Dee Pursehouse at a 46% discount off the package value. Your plant's only getting two important things from above ground. The rest of the nutrients that your plant requires come from the soil. The soil is full of invisible workers that we cannot see with our eyes, but they play a fundamental role in our lives. The protozoa, the nematodes, the bacteria, even viruses can all come together in the root system of the plant, and the plant becomes the scaffolding of a community. We want to know what each one of these groups of organisms do for the plant, and then what is the plant doing to try to select for the beneficial organisms here. Just like us humans have microbes in our guts that help with the decomposition of the food that we eat, the microbes in the soil make nutrients available for plant roots. Plants also use their roots to secrete sugars and feed all below ground organisms. A healthy soil has the full complement of soil biology and therefore can provide all the nutrients a plant is ever gonna need Nutrient bioaccumulators are plants that have a superpower. They can suck in and store more nutrients than any other plant, making the soil richer and healthier. Every action and component is vital in sustaining this underground world. Venture into this transformative world of essential ecology, microbiology, and soil stewardship in the Soil Food Web Essentials course. Together with Dr. Elaine Ingham and a global team of soil educators, discover how you can partner with plants and microorganisms as they shape a more verdant world. Boost your biological partnerships for abundance and resilience on farms, gardens, and landscapes. This course is an accessible starting point for you to choose a path toward ecological restoration, permaculture, producing biologically complete soil amendments, practical microscopy, consulting with production professionals, and advocacy for a new way of living in harmony with our biosphere. Go deeper into the fundamentals of making, assessing, and applying biologically complete amendments, and learn how to rapidly and effectively regenerate soils across farms, ranches, gardens, and landscapes in the foundation courses. Explore over 45 hours of lectures delivered by Dr. Elaine Ingham covering the theory and application of the Soil Food Web approach. Get your questions answered by our science team through our student forum and monthly student-only webinars. Gain a fresh view of climate, soils, water, economics, and community care in the Soil Sponge Workshop. Learn why a healthy soil sponge is the fundamental infrastructure that makes life possible and how biological systems create both our climate and economies. In this five-part live discussion workshop with renowned author and speaker Dee Dee Pursehouse, join with people from around the world to gain understanding of how to address global challenges through land management. This workshop also provides a stepping stone to Dee Dee's new advanced courses due to be launched later in 2024. When you sign up today, you'll also get a coupon for $150 off the upcoming Permaculture Design Certificate course, featuring 70 plus teachers from 23 countries. 
This diverse group of permaculture professionals will help you design ecological and health management systems that work in harmony with nature. A thorough understanding of permaculture principles will allow you to implement thoughtful management practices and help you live in balance with the earth and your community. So to summarize what's included, you'll get the four-part foundation courses taught by Dr. Elaine Ingham, the Soil Food Web Essentials course, the Soil Sponge Workshop with Dee Dee Pursehouse, and a $150 coupon to apply to the Permaculture Design course. The Soil Food Web School offers a 100% money-back guarantee, so if you're not completely satisfied, you can get a full refund in the first 30 days, so long as you've watched 32 lectures or less of the foundation courses. Financing options are now available, so you can pay at your own pace with a firm. Learn how you can level up your soils today. So again, just to reinforce, if you have questions or if you need support, please do not hesitate to contact our team here in this chat or uh, via email. Again, the email is info at soilfoodweb.com. So now we're going to get back with Dr. Elaine for more Q&A. And we have Dr. Adam Cobb here as well. Adam, feel free to chime in when you want. And uh, Elaine, the first question is from Daniel. Is green manure, animal manure, or vermicompost better for beneficial microorganisms? What you're talking about here is uh, the way you treat the uh, organic material that you're putting into the composting process. So, uh, you know, green manure, I, I keep losing the, uh, I need the, oh, I need the question, sorry. 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 <laughs> Here we go. Yep. So uh, green manure, uh, where the, uh, you know, when we're making compost, we have to be very careful about the percentages. So we don't have to be putting any toxic material in. We don't have to be using, you know, calcium carbonate or something, a, a salt basically that's going to cause damage to the microbial community that's present in your composting pro process. We want to, all of the nutrients and such should be coming in with the plants that you're using to put your compost together. So typically we're going after uh, a 10% um, uh, nitrogen um, uh, uh, or materials that have a C to N ratio of somewhere around five to 10 ratios, a uh, ratio of, of uh, uh, yeah, I, okay. Take a breath, calm down. <laughs> um, so we're looking at a certain amount of nitrogen going into the system. Um, and we want a certain amount of green material going in at about 30% and then about 60% um, wide, uh, um, C to N ratio of uh, woody materials is what we would call them. And so you've got to learn about your starting materials and uh, what's going to give you the um, mix of um, green, woody, and uh, high nitrogen material so that you'll be able to compost uh, uh, just and, and monitor to make certain that everything's going right in that deep a decomposition process. So it's a thermometer that you're going to want to have a, you know, a three foot to four foot long uh, stem so that you can measure the temperature going on in the pile. Um, you want to be able to um, look at the microorganisms present in that compost pile as well. So that's what we're really after when we're going, when we're looking for, um, composting. Um, and so you'll get the beneficial or microorganisms. So it doesn't really matter uh, if you call it a green manure pile or an animal manure or a worm compost, they all end you up with what we desire is that mix high diversity of the microorganisms being present in your inoculum that you're going to be putting out into the um, agricultural system or well, uh, orchards, um, any kind of plant production that you're talking about. 
So um, I like ver worm compost a lot when you mm -hmm. um, are present uh, every day, basically, where you can go and check your worms, make certain that they're, um, the temperature's right, that they're functioning correctly, they're not try all trying to crawl out of your worm compost because something's terribly wrong in the middle of the worm compost, making that material not compost. So use these organisms as indicators of what's going on in your compost to make sure that you you've got what you want. Mm -hmm. So green manure, animal manure, animal manures, you want to be a little bit careful because they will carry pathogens. And then you've got to be just absolutely certain that every part of your um, compost pile got to high enough temperature long enough that it would kill those diseases, it would kill those um, pests, problem organisms would be taken out by the high temperature at a for a long enough period of time. You know, it, you if we're looking for beneficial microorganisms, here's again where your microscope comes to play. Mm -hmm. uh, let's look and see what you actually have in your piles. Um, do you have um, bacteria that look like wiggly little creatures, uh, that's mm -hmm. a real good indicator of bad things in your pile and that what do you have to do to make it um, beneficial microorganisms. So that's why working with uh, a mentor that, the, that when you're taking the foundation courses, when you're taking the higher level courses, um, you get to have those kinds of interactions where you can talk to somebody about exactly what you're doing and uh, figure out um, what's not quite right yet and uh, be able to turn it around so you can make really good compost. Okay. Adam, do you want to chime in or we can go for the next question? Elaine, I love the way that you lay that out there that it's an organism focused reality right we have to see what's there and all kinds of materials can work but we want to know the right organisms are in there i have a report to you elaine as i told you yesterday i was worried about my compost pile freezing 100 degrees fahrenheit what is that about 32 celsius out there even though it's getting to negative 10 celsius at night um that's the power of microorganisms it's just yep. going in the core of the pile. And I also wrapped it up real tight like a like a, like a little baby because it's got snow all over it. <laughs> yeah. And it, when it's that cool, you don't really have to worry about it going uh, um, too high, uh, you know, getting, uh, ha getting the bad organisms growing. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't need to worry about the oxygen moving into the pile too much because the speed of growth of the organisms in the pile isn't that great but it's enough to stay above the temperature and um, be able to continue uh, composting yeah i don't have uh, much more to add but uh, i like the combination of thermophilic compost and then you pass through a vermicompost system uh, the tendency is to always enhance more beneficial uh, organisms. So it really depends on the resources you have, the time you have, and what you want to achieve. So uh, if I can leave one of the devices, keep yourself open to test new, uh, new uh, ways to improve your compost. And like Elaine says, every single time, Check on the microscope. Microscope is your is your best ally to take any decision. So let's go for the next question. Uh, it's from Armando. Thank you, Armando. I'm interested in adopting a farm with vegan values and eliminate all animal products, including manure. What are some things to be aware of or any other suggestions to be successful? Thank you. Do you want to start on that, Elaine? Sure. Yeah. Um, going vegan is not a problem at all, as long as you have um, 
nitrogen fixing plants uh, and it's really the microorganisms in the root system or around the root system that are making the difference there. So you want to make certain that you have material uh, that brings the right amount of nitrogen into the pile um, as you would get if you were using animal um, products, including manure. Um, so you're going to be relying on your plant populations. So get out there and find out what the common nitrogen fixing uh, plants are and that you have adequate um, you have adequate inoculum of those nitrogen fixing bacteria that form nodules in the root systems of say things like clover or um, you know different kinds of nitrogen fixing plants. Um, there are not not there are um, species of nitrogen fixing plants uh, nitrogen fixing microorganisms that form the, the structures outside the root system. And there you've got to be, got to be looking at um, the concentration of those nutrients in the plant material. So you're going to be um, cutting a, a stem and taking some of the sap and say using a bricks meter so that you can figure out if you've got adequate levels of those nutrients or whether you got to go out and find a greater diversity of those nitrogen fixing materials so you can get around not uh, a desiring to use the uh, the manures the animal produced new um, material go ahead so who who's coming second carla yeah, I, over, okay i think it also depends on the location on the planet you are right what are the it's a one portion that some it's i know it's kind of picky to talk about it, but we have to have this in mind. Until we can change the system for good, we need to be aware about local legislation. So uh, we don't want you to start on a good path and then get crumbled by any local regulation that are not gonna allow you to sell your product. So have this in mind as well. What else outside the best practices in the farming you need to take care of to set up yourself for success? And it's usually a lot easier when you don't put in the animal byproducts. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to convince the um, authorities that uh, you're going to be disease free. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, but you do want to check into your county or your state's regulations on uh, making compost. Mm -hmm. Adam, anything to add? I would just say, I would remind everybody that um, you want to be hyper-local with this. You want those local organisms. Mm -hmm. And so when I built my pile that's out there right now, that's still going happily despite the freezing weather, um, I'd say 90% of it came from like my yard, right? They were They were trimming some branches. So I had them leave the wood chips, leaves in the fall grass that was dried out after every time it was cut um i even picked mushrooms out of my yard <laughs> and threw them in there um and so and i didn't i was my plan was not to use any animal manure in this pile but a guy down the street has llamas <laughs> so i put a little bit of llama manure in there um so all these things are possible but it really takes doctor to me it's sort of like I always come back to that metaphor of like, if you've ever cooked a pizza in, in a, in a brick oven in someone's backyard, they, they probably showed you how to do it, but they probably had experimented a bunch. And that's what we all have to do with compost, gardening, all that. It's a constant experiment. Um, always be tinkering, right. And always be learning. That's, that's all I wanted to add. Yep. Thank you. I have uh, uh, one thing that I used to, I mean, we have to retake that, Dr. Lane, our weekly walks. Normally, I have a bag in my backpack, so time to time can just get uh, uh, a bit Inocula, of the... Yes, yeah, of the, the mushrooms or... or mm -hmm. yeah, so. yeah, so use everything you have around you to improve and make your life easier. 
So um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, let's go with this one from Debbie. With the goal of maximizing the adoption of practices to support healthy soil biology, are there good ways to balance the rigorous science involved with broad accessibility and lowering the learning curve for prospective practitioners? The science seems to perceive by many as somewhat of a barrier for ordinary people really engaging with soil food web. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, I guess I, um, I'm not aware of, of people not being able to do these uh, methods uh, because the composting is, you know, you just have to be aware of the organisms uh, that are coming in on the various forms of um, organic material that you're putting into your pile. And that's going to be the same whether you're using biological care in, in making your compost or you're just kind of throwing stuff in a pile and crossing your fingers and hoping. Uh, you're still going to turn the piles. You're still going to be looking at or, uh, you know, look, looking for the smell, uh, the information that you can get without uh, much more than a, a, a simple microscope. Um, so, you know, if they, if people are assessing, saying that it's expensive or it's a yeah, high science for me to learn to use a microscope and um, and uh, you know do the assessments of the microorganisms. My uh, grandson is uh, you know fairly young. He's uh, in the five to seven. I can't remember exactly, but he has his own microscope and he looks at the the compost that my daughter is making on property, and so if a seven year old can manage to uh, uh, do this difficult um, uh, uh, science, um, I say it, it might be time to go visit my uh, grandson in uh, South Carolina and see what it is they're doing that allows it to be really simple and easy. So don't, don't get all caught up in, oh, but the carbon nitrogen ratio has to be this or the fungi to the back. Uh, we've, we've got people that really like to pull things apart and um, make it difficult. It's not meant to be difficult in the range of carbon nitrogen ratio in the general range of 10. Uh, that's what we're looking for. Or we're looking for temperatures that are above um, 131 degrees for a full three days. That's you know not really all that difficult. So I, you have to sometimes get in there and get your hands dirty to really understand how how much energy you've got to uh, get involved in making a really good compost. But of course, it's worth it. You're getting yourself away from all of the uh, control of our lives by people who aren't particularly nice folks so yeah I, I think that uh it's about as well looking for how you're going to present what you were talking about and how you're going to look for this information academia is fully immersed on deep terminology they need to be that accurate so uh we can expand science in larger paces. But this is why we have to rely in uh, the extensionists and uh, communicators like our Dr. Cobb uh, to, and how Elaine do, does this brilliant. And this is what like Elaine, I have no words to express, but you really make all these science co concepts so easy to understand. And I think that this is part of our role how we're going to translate all this message, all this information that we're grasping here to a language that folks that you're talking with can understand. And uh, one, uh, like small actions that can expand this in a lot of ways is take a microscope out in farmer's market, for example, or talk with your local school. Can I go for one day in a science fair, talk with kids, show them what is 
under the soil in a mic uh, uh, using a microscope. So words, uh, sorry, images speak louder than words. So uh, it's about how we present this information, how we have help translate all this knowledge being developed in actions that we can easily replicate where we go. And with that, Adam, you were the specialist in <laughs> communication. What do you have to add? Thanks, Carla. I mean, I think that there's a ton that we who have subject matter expertise need to do to make things accessible. And we can go out there into all those complex details, but ultimately we have to bring people a message that um, that they can rally around, where we can develop vision together. But I do want to back out as well and look at the community, because this is the thing that's so exciting to me. If you get a group of people together, not only do you benefit from different perspectives, which helps you find the right answers uh, for what to do, but also people have different personalities. And in almost every group of people, in every community, I've even been to the edges of the world to some indigenous communities with Peace Corps volunteers and such, about 10% of people are pretty entrepreneurial and innovative. And rather than spend a ton of time trying to convince people who are skeptical of the current science, and, and I agree that the regenerative movement um, needs more multi-year, multi-site, highly replicated research trials. We definitely do to have that level of, of evidence. Um, however, you want to find those tinkers, those investigators, those natural entrepreneurs that are going to say, yeah, we'll give it a try. And the trying is the important thing right now. Getting people out there on in different contexts, in different climates, in different soils, in different landscapes, reporting back what worked. That's the move this thing forward. And so... I'm excited that we have that kind of community here at the school. Like in the chat, there's a lot of people saying, here is where I'm, uh, this this is where my land is, uh, you mm -hmm. know, who's your grandson so I can bring him out here and he can help <laughs> work with me. Awesome. Uh, he's only seven years old. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, and, and he could- but In training. In he's training. in training. And if you came to his parents' house, they would have a wonderful time, but the uh, <laughs> time, but uh, vice versa, too scary. Um, and we have um, um, people who have uh, finished all of the courses, and they are have are now been they now have been working, you know, for twenty years, fifteen years, ten, five years, and you find out where the con consultants are by mm -hmm. going to our website and taking a look at where all the different consultants, where all the different labs are, and pick the one that's closest to you, give him a call, um, find him, find out what, you know, his uh, costs, what his um, fees, you know, pee, yeah, well, how much you have to uh, mm -hmm. pay, what, what's mm -hmm. his hourly rate, there we go, finally got it out of my mind. <laughs> I unfortunately have another meeting that I really desperately mm -hmm. must go to. Yes. Thank you, Elaine. I was just going to give the last uh, information for the folks, but we really appreciate your time. Uh, and today we had the pleasure to have Dr. Vandana and Dr. Elaine on this webinar. Uh, but we have three more webinars coming. The next one is Mixed Species Orchard, a uh, st study case with Little Dog Farms with Joe Tobaya, our uh, student. And her, she's presenting the case of her clients. <laughs> and this webinar will be on February 1st, 11 a.m. Pacific time. So it's a different time than today. Do not forget to uh, put a notification in your our YouTube channel. So you're going to get the uh, inform the sorry, the chime in for uh, the, the next webinars. Then we're going to have symbiotic impact of agroecology and soil food web. Incredible chat with uh, Ernest Gotch and our student Philip Barton, who also works close with Ernest. And following, uh, you're going to hear back from me, Dr. Cobb and Dr. Elaine. 
talking about cultivating life in soils, why soil matters, and how to further your education in soil regeneration. So take a note, put in your calendars. We hope to see you again. And uh, in the name of the school, I can only say thank you to all of you that are here today, especially on the early birds in the <laughs> West Coast here in West. And uh, I want to thank all the amazing staff that run in the background for these webinars. You guys make my life much easier. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all of you. Have a great week and see you next time. Don't forget, Don't forget to, click to click that, that like button, button subscribe, subscribe to our, to our channel, channel, and ring, ring the, the notification, notification bell, bell to stay, to stay updated, updated with all our new videos. videos.